morning and welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church. I'm Connie. And I'm Danny. And we invite you to come and shelter with us in this season of gratitude and response to the great news that Christ has been raised. Let us worship God. Come on in. Reading from Matthew's Gospel, starting in 1024. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered. Nothing is secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot fear the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs on your head are counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. This, friends, is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson is a continuation of what Connie read to you earlier. Uh, We are continuing in Matthew 10, verses 34 through 39. Listen to these words of joy and happiness. Do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Do you remember almost a half century ago, Alfred Hitchcock's classic horror film Psycho burst into the world? It's now infamous shower scene where the actress Janet Lee was stabbed to death in the shower by Anthony Perkins, psycho. It's interesting because according to an interview Lee, Janet Lee did with the New York Times before her death, she said the scene had a dramatic effect on her in spite of the fact that above all people, She knew that it was fake and just a movie. After viewing the famous shower scene, Lee says she was seized with an overwhelming and lasting terror. I stopped taking showers, she said in the interview. And even now, I only take baths. 
In fact, when the actress stayed in a hotel or at a friend's home, she was given to panic attacks. I make sure the doors and windows of the house are locked, she confessed, and I leave the bathroom door and shower curtain open. I'm always facing the door watching no matter where the shower head is. Fear. It is real, it is strong, and it can be debilitating. One more story, a little more lighter. A story in Oregon a while back, deputies received a 911 call to a home for a burglary in progress. It seems that a woman was reporting that a stranger was in her bathroom and that the stranger had the bathroom door locked. She said she could see the shadows moving under the door of the intruder. Within minutes, several deputies surrounded the home, called for the canine backup team. They said they could hear rustling noises coming from the bathroom. After calling to the suspect several times over a loudspeaker, deputies went into the home with their guns drawn. After, facing, after forcing open the bathroom door, deputies found the villain. As we entered the home, we could hear the rustling the Washington County Sheriff's Department Rogers wrote in his report of the incident. We made several announcements and the rustling became more frequent. We breached the bathroom door and encountered a very thorough vacuuming job being done by a Romba robotic vacuum cleaner. No burglar, just a very conscientious, conscientious Roomba doing its job. No word on whether the, de the deputies filed charges in the incident, said a local reporter, but the suspect's record appears to be clean. Thank you. Thank you. Again, fear. Fear. One of those things we live with every day. We know it. You know it. We are surrounded by it. And in this passage in Matthew 10, our context is dealing with some of the disciples' fear and their call to discipleship. So Jesus is getting ready to send out the 12 for the first time and telling them what they are going to encounter in previous verses. If you remember, he tells them to go out and bring peace, and if they don't accept the peace, shake the dust off your feet and move on to the next place. Jesus is telling them to, to heal, to cast out demons, to do all kinds of things in Christ's name. Well, think about those disciples. They've been with their master for some time, but they don't know yet what we know is getting ready to happen in the rest of the gospel account. They don't know the resurrection. They've seen some miracles and things, but Jesus is saying, now it's time to go out, go. Go be ready, and don't be fearful. Talks about the sparrows, that these two sparrows that are worth about a penny are worth everything to God, and you are so much worth so much more than those sparrows. God knows every hair on your head. It's a little interesting to think about, isn't it? Every hair on your head in these COVID days, But God does, and God cares for us. It's the way Jesus is telling them that this is not going to be easy. A slave is not greater than its master or than its teacher. A student is not greater than its master. That just means they treat me terribly from Jesus' perspective. Why would you think they would treat you any different? So be ready, friends. And don't fear the one that can just hurt you physically, but fear the one who can hurt you soul and body, life and death. And of course, they're saying, Jesus is telling them the bigger picture in all this is you may suffer some, you may incur some trials and tragedies, but it is God who is with you and it is God whom you serve. So then the second part of this gets to discipleship. So the whole first part is about fear. 
how yes, Jesus acknowledges you will be afraid and bad things will happen, but know that you are with you. You have the power from the Holy Spirit that has been given through Christ. You go out and do what I tell you to do. I understand it's hard, but go and do it. And I can't wait till we come back. We'll all sit down. We'll have a bowl of popcorn. We'll talk about everything you did. It'll be great. But for now, get ready and go. And in the second reading, we get into this difficult passage that is one of the most difficult, really, certainly in the New Testament, maybe in the whole Bible. Do not think I've come to bring peace on earth. Wait, but you're the prince of peace. I've come not to bring peace, but a sword. I've come to set a man against his father, daughter against a mother, daughter-in-law against a mother-in-law. Once foes will be members of one's household. Happy Father's Day to you. Whoever loves your family more than me, you're doomed, you're cursed forever. Pick up your cross, lose your life to me, and I will make sure that you are given new life for me. Okay, preacher, got that last part. What about that sword? What about hating my family? What's that all about? Well, as we often see from Jesus, as a teacher, as the rabbi, as those, as he who is teaching those around him, he uses hyperbole, he uses similes, metaphors, illustrations, allegories, whatever means he can to teach. And in this case, is Jesus talking about a literal sword? We know how much Jesus loved to wield a sword, right? Stabbed all kinds of people throughout the Bible, right? No, of course not. As a matter of fact, the one time at the Garden of Gethsemane when he is being taken and Peter cuts off the high priest's slave's ear, Jesus says, stop, put it away, and heals him. So then what is this imagery with Jesus and the sword? If it's symbolic, which of course it is, what does it mean? Well, let's deal with the second part first. I've come to set a man against father and daughter against mother. Why? Why? That's horrible, horrible. I'm not supposed to love my family. No, that's not what God is saying at all. Jesus is telling his disciples here that God is first. And it is harsh language. And setting one against each other in their own household, certainly we know that to be true in a variety of ways. It doesn't mean they hate each other. It doesn't mean they're no longer family. What it means is that families have disagreements. We know that. We got a new puppy two days ago. Adorable. It yet has no name. Why? We've probably been through a hundred names. There are four of us with four different ideas. And in that light way, we have been kind of set against each other. How do we move forward? I don't know. We're still working on it. We are hoping the right name will bubble. But we know that within a household, each and every person has unique context, view, understandings of the way that the world works. And so, of course, you're going to be set against one another. How about politics? Go around the room. Go. Yay. All right. Um, That's another area. And this is one that says, you've got to put me first, even above your family. I think absolutely families can become idols that we put in front of everything else. I don't want that to go too far the other way to say that families are not important. That's not what Jesus is saying at all. He's saying families are crucial and important, but God is first. And when you lose your life, you will gain it. When you pick up my cross, I will grant you new life. So the family part is is difficult to read, but when you think about it, of course, we all have differences and our allegiance is to God. And then secondly, to our families whom we love and are given as gifts from God for this journey. So don't ever take that or let it be used 
as a way for families to harm one another or anybody to harm anybody else. So the primary image, Jesus with wielding his sword. Um, I'd like to lift up uh, an interpretation by Dr. King, Martin Luther King. If you remember last week, we talked about the peace that we get from God that enables us to know that Christ is within us. We have an inner peace. We have a God who is intimate and loves us and walks with us. And this week, we are moving into a peace that pertains to the way that we live our lives. And that is the discipleship peace. We talked about fear a little bit. Jesus is saying it's going to be hard, but you're going to be okay. And then secondly, be disciples and discipleship. And that discipleship category today is peace, living our faith, showing, acting our faith. So I asked, um, well, I put out information this week about a sermon that Dr. King gave uh, called When Peace Becomes Obnoxious, 1956 at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Louisville, Kentucky. And he talks about this idea of peace and talks about this verse, Jesus with his sword. Let me set it up for you. I'm going to read a few selections from this. So the context is University of Alabama was uh, overruled to deny admissions to persons because of their race. A brave young lady whose name is Authorine Lucy was accepted as the first African-American student to be admitted in the history of the University of Alabama. Well, when she came, crosses were burned, eggs and bricks were thrown at her. The mob jumped on top of her car in which she was riding. Finally, the president and trustees advised her to leave for her own safety and the safety of the school. Next day, in the, in the newspaper, the headline read, things are quiet in Tuscaloosa today. There is peace on the campus of the University of Alabama, which brings Dr. King into this idea to talk about what is peace and what is Christ's peace. Yes, things are quiet in Tuscaloosa, he says, but it was peace at a great price. This is the type of peace that all people of goodwill hate. It is the type of peace that is obnoxious, not like your drunk uncle at the Christmas Eve party. And listen to the strength of this phrase. It is the type of peace that stinks in the nostrils of the Almighty God. Wow. A peace that stinks in the nostrils of the Almighty God. And lifts up this passage. Think that I have come not to bring peace, but the sword. Certainly he is not saying he comes not to bring peace in the higher sense. What he is saying is that I come not to bring a peace, which is a shallow peace, he's making the case, of escapism, This peace that fails to confront the real issues of life, the peace that makes for stagnant complacency. I come to bring a sword is not a physical sword. Whenever I come, a conflict is precipitated, Jesus is saying, between the old and the new, between justice and injustice, between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. I come to declare war over injustice. I come to declare war on evil. And then later on, he has a talk with a man, doesn't say whether he's white or black, who's telling Dr. King that the peace is being destroyed in the community because of what his actions are, and they had good race relations. Dr. King says, I agree that it is more tension now. He says, you're right, it is less peaceful in your definition but gives this definition that is one of my favorites. Peace is not merely the absence of this tension, but the presence of justice. It is not merely the absence of tension, but the presence of justice. 
And Dr. King goes on to say, yes, it's true that if the African American accepts his place, accepts exploitation and injustice, there will be peace. But it is this peace that is displeasing to God that is boiled down to stagnant complacency. He says, if peace means this, I don't want peace. If peace means accepting second-class citizenship, I don't want it. If peace means keeping my mouth shut in the midst of injustice and evil, I don't want it. If peace means being complacently adjusted to the deadening status quo, I don't want peace. If peace means a willingness to be exploited economically, dominated politically, humiliated, and segregated, I don't want peace. And then it concludes with this sentence, the inner peace that comes as a result of doing God's will is the peace that we seek. So Dr. King's interpretation is that where Christ has come to, as he said, do you remember when he stood up in Nazareth early in Luke, right after in Luke 4 when he comes out of being tempted in the wilderness? He stands up in the, in the synagogue and says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. This is quoting Isaiah 61. To bring good news to the poor has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That is the sword that Christ brings. It is a sword of tension. It is a sword that says we have to step into things that are difficult and challenging. This week I heard somewhere, some form of media, someone had called in or written in or emailed in and said, you know, my pastor is driving me nuts with this reconciliation business. Why don't we just wait till everything calms down and we can get back to things as normal? It's exactly the piece that that person that Dr. King was talking to was talking about, a shallow justice a shallow peace that was not indeed peace for all. And if we don't allow ourselves to fully investigate and get into and seek to fix and work with God's love through our discipleship, the peace is a false peace that will not last. I'm a terrible baker. Every time I try to get the cake out of the pan, it breaks. It crumbles into pieces, fractions, fissures. The saving grace is what? Icing. You can slap enough icing, get at the gallon in the ice cream scooper, just plop it on there. Fixes all of it. Nobody knows except the baker. This surface piece is just like that. The fissures and the brokenness remain underneath, and we are pretending ourselves if we do not address, learn, teach, experience, grow in the moment that we're in. A few churches ago, <clears throat> someone gave me this sticky note. It was on my office door. It says, please keep politics out of the church. I laminated it. I carry my Bible that I carry with me every day. It's not that I, I tell you who to vote for. It's not that I tell you even what to be involved in. My hope is to empower you with conviction that you can go into the world to live as a disciple of Christ, championing those causes that you believe Christ would have you champion. And you cannot separate politics from Christ from his ministry, and therefore from ours. Where two or more are gathered, yes, politics are there, but thankfully also God. So I want to respond to that. Some of you might be thinking, gosh, just let it go, preacher. Let it go. We know what's going on. We've chosen our teams. We've got our arguments. We're all good. I want to lift up why I think this is such an important moment in history for our Christian journey. This is a gospel issue. This is far above and supersedes politics. I'm leaning heavy on 
of a YouTube video, which I would encourage you to read. Phil Vischer used to do Veggie Tales. He does a 17 minute video called Holy Post Race in America. Listen to what I hope to be the facts of the policies that got us to this point. The reality in this time is that African-American households have one-tenth of the wealth of white households. Why is that? Let's go back to after the Civil War. Nine states enacted vagrancy laws. That's fact. Made it a crime not to have a job. It applied only to black men. They continued to add other things such as mischief, including insulting gestures. Eight states allowed prisoners to be used by plantation owners, receiving little to no money. Just freed from these plantations, now being leased out through these sham crimes. More petty crimes led to more arrests, which led to convict leasing. This grew into what we called black codes. Many states required blacks to sign yearly labor contracts. If they refused, they could be arrested, fined, forced into unpaid labor. Around 1877, after the end of Reconstruction, where things had a chance, Jim Crow laws, which were legal segregation, but not separate but equal, segregated laws, started 1877 around, up until around 54 with Brown versus Board of Education, many say up until 64, the Civil Rights Act. Of course, we know this was social marginalizing and ostracizing for African Americans. Schools, churches, housing, jobs, restrooms, hotels, restaurants, hospitals, prisons, funeral homes, morgues, cemeteries, so many more. Finally, Brown versus Board of Education desegregating the schools, 54. And in 56, a Southern Manifesto was signed to maintain, by several southern states, maintaining the Jim Crow laws by any and all means necessary. Five states added 50 new laws after 54. Again, these are facts. Back to that difference of wealth. The number one source of intergenerational wealth in America is home ownership. In the 1930s through the 60s, the federal government enacted policies to encourage white families to own homes and discourage black families. Example, 1934, feds instituted a risk, a risk rating system for neighborhoods for safe investment for federally backed mortgages. Black neighborhoods deemed too risky, marked off with red ink, now we know as redlining. After World War II, there was a suburban housing boom. Most of the deeds restricted to whites only. Blacks couldn't live in white neighborhoods and because of redlining, couldn't get federally insured loans. Until 1950, realtors could lose their license if they helped a black family buy a house in a white neighborhood. Federal Housing Administration determined highways were a good method for separating black and white neighborhoods. FHA, that same organization, funded huge white-only suburban housing developments, leaving blacks behind in the inner cities. After World War II, the GI Bill provided for returning soldiers low-cost mortgages, low-interest loans to start businesses and farms, tuition and living expenses for high school students and colleges. But the way it was administrated left out close to a million black soldiers who on paper were eligible, but in the administration were not. After World War II, white families were able to grow home equity, grow wealth for their retirement, inheritance, and college education. Moving into the 70s, because we had forced them, we had told them how much money they could make, what kind of jobs they could have, where they could live and where they couldn't. Education, always a piece of this, substandard in areas. Blacks had little income, black college degrees, had grown up, even in that time in the 70s, fully segregated schools. Many manufacturing jobs moved to the suburbs where blacks could not live. In 1970, only 28% of black fathers had access to a car. 
And listen to this stat. In 1970, 70% of African-American men had good blue-collar jobs, 70%. By 1987, that number was down to 28%. What happened? The war on drugs. It begins in the early 80s with the Reagan-Bush administration. I'll get to Clinton, just hang in there. The drug epidemic was seen not as a health crisis, but as a crisis of criminality. In 1991, the anti-drug budget of the Department of Defense went from 33 million to 1 billion. 1986 Anti-Drug Abuse Act, mandatory minimum sentences much harder for African-Americans than for whites, specifically crack cocaine, which was associated with African-Americans, as opposed to powder cocaine, which was associated with whites. Mandatory, and any of these convictions are mandatory evictions from federal housing, elimination of government benefits, including student loans, food stamps, other things. Clinton, in the 90s, Funding for public housing was cut by 17 billion. Funding for prisons increased by 19 billion. Three strikes and you're out, devastated, devastated. The drug prison population exploded with all these mandatory requirements. Started no knock entries. In Minneapolis, 1986, there were 35 that year. By 1996, there were 700. This is what took the life of Brianna Taylor in Louisville. I believe they have rescinded no-knock entries with police not announcing who they are, not dressed in police attire. They just break into a home. Federal grants to police departments, and in this process, the police departments were, became more military in scope. Federal grants of police departments were tied to the number of drug arrests. The results were the expansion in the total prison population from 35,000 in 1980 up over 2 million presently. Increased prison population driven by changes in sentencing policy. Again, if you're a felon, the idea of incarceration was for you to pay your time, your debt to society, and then you were free. You are never free once you are a felon. You can't get a job. You're barred from public housing. The negative impact of being convicted for African Americans is twice as large as for white applicant. So in 2006, one in, 100, one in 106 whites were incarcerated, one in 14 African Americans. And within that one in 14, the age group 20 to 35, that is the age of which you are starting and growing families, one in nine. African Americans and whites roughly use drugs at the same rate, six times more imprisoned for African Americans. I'm out of time, but there are study upon study from education, Even Chuck Colson, who's a, a pastor who's got the prison fellowship ministry, had this statement signed by several evangelical leaders. Our over-reliance on incarceration fails to make us safe or restore the people and community who have been harmed. So my purpose in this was to tell you why I think this is important. Those, as I understand them, were facts. In America, we stand on freedom, but it is something everyone has not had the same opportunity to embrace and explore. Yes, if you work hard in this country, you can succeed, but we don't all start from the same place. Because of these that I told you about, these policies, starting from the Civil War, where folks were not, blacks, African Americans were not allowed to accrue wealth, housing, education, get jobs that were decent, led them into a place of poverty. And then the justice system took them over. This isn't interpretation. This isn't some lefty or some righty preacher trying to get his agenda through. These are policy facts. 
So when we see people are angry, there's a reason. We can't tell people to pull up their bootstraps if we give them no boots and have no straps. We have come a long way, but we're not there yet. So I encourage you from this passage today to overcome the fear of doing what we know we need to do to educate ourselves, to discuss, and to take action. And then know that the sword that is brought is one that we as Christians are called to. When we see things that aren't right, we are called to step into it and share our faith, our conviction, and make it right. So that all can experience this peace that Dr. King was lifting up. Not a shallow, let's just get through it, maybe it'll die down kind of peace, but one that can openly declare and affirm that when we say together we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men, all people are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Not all of us have these. And until all do, none of us do. So go out with your sword of grace, conviction, get into the mix, and let us be disciples for the peace of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen.